Hello and welcome to the Chris Knoll Podcast on iCode Media. Today I'm excited to have a great conversation with Dr. John Nolan, who we've had on the podcast before. And you know, you should know that uh, Matthew Health is a uh, is a sponsor of the podcast. But what I really like about uh, Dr. John Nolan is he allows me to ask him the questions whatever question I want to ask him. So as a, a podcast sponsor, they have not tried to influence my approach to uh, to asking questions. Uh, they're always about the evidence, and I want to dig into the evidence behind vitreous health today. Uh, I think it's pretty compelling. I've got some questions that I think uh, are probably challenge questions. They're probably the common questions people might ask. And so we're going to get into that. And um, as always, be sure to subscribe to the podcast, write a review, share it with your friends, and support those who support us. So today I want to talk about the MyDay Multifocal for just a second. It has been a really great thing in our practice for our patients who are presbyopes of all areas, but you know those tricky presbyopes are always the ones that are kind of emerging, where they don't want to give up any of their faraway vision, but they're having some struggles up close. And so what uh, the MyDay Multifocal has been able to do for us is to allow those patients to transition into a multifocal more easily. And then as we have those patients progress into other levels where they need more ad powers it's been a nice smooth transition so the ultimate hurdle that we've seen in our practice before the my day multifocal was that we'd have patients who would resist any transition to a multifocal lens because of that distance blur we just haven't seen that so if you haven't started using my day multifocal in your practice I would encourage you to start, check it out, uh, contact, reach out to your Cooper reps for those trial lenses uh, and commit to My Day Multifocal for your patients. I think they're going to like it. If you haven't checked out Mackie Health yet for your patients in Category 1 through Category 4, I think there's a lot of evidence that you should be considering. The first is if we just look at AREDS 2 and what they, they talk about, Mackie Health is a, so for patients in Category 3 and Category 4 um, AMD, Mackie Health is a great option for them that follows that entire um, that entire protocol, and it also adds mesozeaxanthine to the mix, which if you look at some of the evidence, I believe shows me that it's going to thicken the macular pigment better than without mesozeaxanthine. It also uses the a correct AREDS2 dose of zinc uh, at 25 milligrams, and so you don't have to worry so much about the potential side effects of zinc. The other thing to, to think about, and it's beyond the scope of this, although you've probably heard me talk on other podcasts, is that in patients in category one and two, there may be some additional benefit uh, to supplementing them with something that may be a little bit less than the AREDS2, so you don't have to add as much to it. And that's where I use the Mackie Health LMZ3. And so I think if you haven't done this yet, I'd consider Mackie Health in your practice and for your patients. And it's been great for my patients, and, um, and we really feel like we can have the ability to uh, help those patients in all categories of macular degeneration. So, Professor Nolan, thanks for doing this again. This is the third time I've had John, uh, and, um, and I'm excited because, you know, about five months ago, we, we uh, had the fly study come out, and we were able to have uh, an assessment of doing something else for the vitreous uh, for patients. So actually, I'm kind of getting right into it, but actually, I, I don't want to do that yet. I want to I want to talk to you about your running. I saw a picture of you running. Were you running a marathon or a half marathon or what? Yeah. Yeah, great. I was pacing a half marathon. And um, so I use I use raced half marathons and I still still can race them. But um, yeah, it's just so good to get back with people on the running line to get to see people kind of run towards i think that's the beauty of running by the way you know you don't have to be the best at it to have the best experience um so that's why i like pacing because i see people kind of aim for their targets and some of them get it some of them fall short but we had a great day yeah i was uh, i was pacing a half marathon in waterford on our beautiful greenway so yeah what's your pace what's your what pacer were you what schedule or what pace uh, that was a 140 half okay. marathon i'm t typically uh, a 130 pacer but um, they needed someone to do the 140. I've, I You're actually fast, had the, man. Yeah. Well, I had the pleasure of racing in New York, believe it or not, the half marathon. And I, I, I did a sub-80 half marathon. That's my PB, my personal best in, in New York. That was a very special. A sub-80? So you were under 120? Yeah. Sub That's six pretty minute, good. Sub-six-minute miles, yeah. Or just around six-minute miles. Yeah. So. That's fast, man. And so I think I think my fastest is 130. Uh, yeah. Is my fastest half marathon. You... You and I are going to have to, um, one time that you're in the United States, uh, yeah. we're going to have to work out together uh, sometime. I didn't realize that until I saw you in, um, well, 
where were we this – was it Houston? It was Houston. Houston yeah. 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 And so I, I didn't realize that until you and I had a chance to sit down and chat a bit. And I was like, oh, yeah. what? You're – and then – um no, it was Washington DC. It was Washington, oh, Washington DC. Washington, that's why I'm thinking because yeah. I actually yeah. went on that lovely run down by the. By yeah, the, uh, yeah. The okay, we got to plan that. That's going to have to be on on uh, on on my list of things to do with John Nolan. Plus, <laughs> you know what happens when you run, and I've said this before, but your brain sort of opens up, especially when you get those long distances. Like, mm. uh, like uh, there's there's some kind of key t- points in time where I've built fellowship with guys that. I can distinctly remember that mile marker that we crossed when we were yeah. done with the BS. We weren't yeah. just like having these sort of like, you know, uh, conversations that were like, Hey, how's your day going? And how's your mm. wife and family doing? Which are important, yeah. but we got beyond that. And so mm. there's a couple of them where I remember that. And it's like, you know, five, six miles, boom, six miles. There you go. And now we're having a real mm. conversation about things yeah. that are impacting their lives, like things that are, and, and there's something about those kind of hard moments um, that, that put, uh, it's probably women too, but put men in a place that they can, um, you know, sort of exercise whatever's on their mind. I don't know. It's yeah. weird. What do you think about that? I, I agree. Uh, and I think as we, as we get that little bit older, that becomes more important. I mean, I know I always, I look up to you with your family and how, you know, the, I can't remember how many kids you have, but I know you have a lot of kids, right? Um, nine. Nine you deserve kids. a medal. Yeah. Nine. You deserve a medal. And my I wife, two, my wife gets all the accolades. I mean, absolutely. I, I have two, <laughs> and I'm exhausted. Um, but I, I agree with you. I have this, you know, this group that we run with on a Sunday, um, and it's kind of men, typically around my age, and we we do all that nicety stuff, as you say. But you do go into you. It's really, really like my wife kind of makes sure <laughs> I do it. Jane makes sure I do it because she knows how important it is for me to be able to kind of just talk about stuff that men are not good at talking about. And I think you get into that comfort zone where you you can do that. And then, and you know, when I was younger, actually, when I was training, it was kind of around the time where we were writing the major grants. You do have those kind of other moments as well where you get clarity on something. And, and what I can remember about that is that it might be something relating to, um, you know, a, a, um, protocol design or something from an experiment that you don't know kind of really how to go about it. And then you just get this clarity that comes in. And I remember that I had when I was writing the grant for the, Euro, the Crest uh, program, which was two years in the making. I ran every day at lunchtime. I just dropped the <laughs> tools, went out. I had fortunate being a researcher, I can do that. I went and we have a lovely area here. And that was really, I, I truly believe that was one of the reasons. And I remember some of the researchers saying to me, like, you're so busy. How do you get time to run? I said, I'm too busy not to. That's yeah. the point. I'm too busy not to find time to run. Because if you don't, that's where, that's where it all falls down. And I think you can extend that then into kind of what we're talking about, life and wellness and and particularly on the back end of, of what we've all come through with, you know, the uncertainties around the pandemic and um, all. Of, so, yeah, I think I think find, it's cliche, but finding that balance and that people have different balances for you and me, it might be, you know, getting a workout, going for a run. Um, I play a lot of tennis lately. I've kind of not that I've stopped running so much, but I, I get the same type of enjoyment and endorphins from from tennis, which I just started playing actually during during the pandemic. And um, can you put a lot of English on the ball? Pardon? Can you get a lot of spin on the ball? <laughs> I think I can. Um, I'm getting much <laughs> better. <laughs> um, I'm I, very I, competitive. I, I like yeah. tennis. Sorry, you're competitive. I, I bet you are. Yeah, I, I yeah I hate not winning. So when I play tennis, <laughs> I, I, you know I say this. I actually coach. Um, uh, we have this game in Ireland called hurling, and for for the girls, it's called camogie, and it's basically like lacrosse. Um, mixed between lacrosse and hockey, it's a very fast field sport. And my daughter Penny plays, and I coach her team. You know. So I can see all the mammies and daddies looking at me because I'm kind of very serious. You know, I take it very serious and I'm saying to them, you know, your mammies and daddies are telling you, you know, it's all about having fun. But I say to them, winning is fun. (laughs) So let's figure out if we can win. So maybe that's not the right approach. But anyway, you know, I no, I think I think there is something to that. I I like to play tennis. I I grew up my dad and I um, I'd play tennis with my dad. And he was always a good sport. You know, he could have always beat me um, until I got, you know, faster enough to be able to move the ball in different places. But 
I do not like to lose, um, especially when it's something that I think I'm really good at. You know, I don't want to lose. And one of my one of my best friends from optometry school is named Scott Ackerman. He practices in Garden City, Kansas. Hopefully, he's listening. Um, mm. But if you are Scott, uh, Scott can beat you in any sport, any time, okay. no matter how good a shape you're in. He right. will beat you. And right. tennis was no exception. And I always I remember like playing with tennis with Scott when we were optometry school. And uh, you know I can put a little spin on the ball here and there, but like mm. he's a good player, like a really good player. And you're sitting there, and, and he, would, he would serve up the ball to me, and he'd put enough spin on it where I'd just be like, do you want me to return this, or, or are, we, are we just going to have a serving contest for, for yeah. Scott Ackerman? And okay. then he'd, he'd ease up a little bit, but just enough to, like, let me return it, and then he'd, you know, he, he'd just walk all over me. Yeah, it's game yeah, over. Yeah. So, sure anyway, Scott, if you're listening, you've yeah. bested me at, at too many sports. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the science to tennis, though, isn't it? It's the... You know, it's the small things that you can do that make the big difference to the, you know, the, how you stand, you know, how you hold a racket, the follow through. Um, and it's what I love about tennis. For me, it's a game of patience. If you're good enough, it can be just a game of patience. You know, I, when I'm not playing well, I'm going for the win straight away and you never get the win straight away. You, you have to earn the win. Um, mm. So mm. unless you're playing a really good player like your friend Scott, I'm sure he could probably just yeah. return it. Yeah, he doesn't it in have to earn it. Get, With yeah. me, he doesn't have to earn it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, sorry. So the tennis, the tennis oh, is ahead, funny though. The tennis is funny, Chris, because um, speaking about today's topic, floaters, um, this is when I realized that I actually didn't like having the, the floaters that I had. Mm. And so... Sample size. Is that what was that one of the reasons that started the the fly study? No, not not at all. Um, and because I, we were the fly study is is you know there's ten years work gone into the fly study in terms of the observational. That's what people don't realize. They look at. Now I know. One, this one is why paper. it's fun to talk to you is to unpack that because I actually wanted to start there because um, because first when I when I was reading the fly study uh, you have to you basically start by. By how do you even get to knowing which supplements are potentially uh, involved in reducing floaters? So the biochemistry within the vitreous and what makes the vitreous sticky and what makes the collagen fibers op uh, opacified versus more um, more integrated and better connected without obscuring uh, light. So I was reading that and I'm like, I bet there is years of mm. stuff that goes into that. So unpack that a little bit to me about where you start and how you get there from a, from a standpoint yeah, I, of vitreous. I'll do my best. I'll do my best, of course. And, and the first thing to say is that, you know, it's, it wasn't, you know, th there were so many people that have contributed to this, to this idea. Classically, I mean, if any of your kind of viewers or listeners um, really want to do a deep dive into the vitreous, they need to kind of start getting comfortable with the works of um, Dr. Jerry Sibak out of California. And um, his, his, big, his big piece of information from the work that he does, and he works with patients all day long, is that, you know, having vitreous floaters, um, symptomatic, is a problem, you know, and it, 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 it affects the health, it affects the quality of life of the patient. So, one of the first, the, the, the kind of parallel universe of what Dr. Sibak was doing and what we've been doing with our kind of macular work is that, you know, having bad visual function, aka reduced contrast sensitivity, glare disabilities, all these are a problem. And they really affect the quality of your vision. And we shouldn't be okay with that. Classic eye medicine ophthalmology mm -hmm. is okay with that. And even optometry to agree, it's like, they're fine. Don't worry about them. They don't bother you. But the first learnings in all of this are that they are a real problem for your patient. And we, we shouldn't dismiss that. We should. And if you look at his work, his earlier works, he's, he, he looks at these things called utility values, which is basically a medical way of quantifying the negative impact. And like this is right up there with having diseases like macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy in terms of how they affect quality of life. They're a problem. And the reason why maybe we don't, why we ignore that 80% of the eye, and this piece of the eye that gives you your optical system, we kind of just accept that it gets old and it, there's liquid fraction and all. And, as I, and I'm a little embarrassed, by the way, because as I started to study it, it just became obvious to me that 
you know, all these kind of really kind of sight-threatening, really impactful kind of retinal problems are in, in many ways connected to degeneration of the vitreous, you know, um, macular holes, uh, tears, detachments. If you have a really healthy, structured vitreous, the risk of those diseases is, is, is much more unlikely. So from a, from a classic medicine perspective, I think... And um, that's important. And so I yeah, suppose the we first, have the we have piece, sorry, sorry, I was going to But I think that yeah. to amplify your point, it, it, we I think we're trained largely in mm-hmm. eye care to say, well, that's not it, it may be a symptomatic problem for you, but it's not really a problem problem. So you just mm-hmm. have to deal with it. But one of the things in the fly study in terms of the I think it was in the background of that you brought up that I honestly I never really thought about that much um, mm-hmm. was, you know, I know patients are bothered by them. But when you quantify that that discomfort, that visual discomfort, I think that you made reference to a, another paper that that looked at patients would be willing to give 1.1 yeah. years of their life for 10. What was, what was the actual number? So 1.1 years right, of their yeah. life for, for for 10 years of their remaining life. That was from Sibak. That was his work, actually. Um, yeah. You know, it's just. So we just don't think about that. You know, we just don't think oh. about it. It's, this is so significant that if you put it to a patient, you know, you would give up 1.1 years of, of a 10-year time period in order to have life 8.9 years without floaters, right? Yeah. So that's that's pretty significant when you really – because we always think like, well, people just always want to live as long as they possibly can. And, and this is answering the question of like what is the value of that symptom? Yeah, I agree. I think there's two other kind of important misconceptions in here that kind of this kind of the platform of the kickstart of all of this is that, you know, of course, risk factors, we look at age, myopia, diabetes, um, and so on. But age, people, your patients that are, are suffering with this, they're not all necessarily, in fact, we know they're not all old. If you look at, there's, there was one online study done, published, a proper study, where they basically asked people to volunteer, you know, um, if they had um, issues with floaters. And they, they, they reported data like the age, the mean age was 30 years of age. <laughs> so, yes, vitreous degeneration is very much an age related, but the vitreous floaters can start um, affecting us very uh, early in our lives. We know, you know, from age of 40, that you know, we really see structural changes to the vitreous. That's meaningful. You know, um, liquid fraction and it just it, it excels from from here on in. Um, so, th- I think the other big learning is that you know we may say in eye care, oh well, they go away. They might they, they'll probably go away. I think the data very much says that that's not the case. People that are symptomatic, their problem doesn't go away. Um, in, in fact, we quantify that it gets significantly worse in a relatively short period of time. Um, and again, if you quantify properly by looking at measures of visual function, you know, that are connected to the presence of vitreous floaters. One of, so from our perspective, we, I was very reluctant to do this work, by the way. Um, there How was, come? Um, because I was uncomfortable with my knowledge on the vitreous. I'd spent my whole life studying macular nutrition and visual functions, and I was like, well, why is no one talking about the vitreous? And um, there was a guy from Germany, uh, Robert Kuckling, um, who spent his whole life working with nutrition as well. He's a veterinarian, actually. And he, he, we, we knew Robert and his company, Abiga Vision, for many years. He, he would be a partner with our university. And um, so he kept telling me about, you know, possibilities for the vitreous and what John why have you not looked beyond the macula and, you know, and, and I'm always very protective of being good <laughs> at what we do. So I said, okay, let's reluctantly, I said, let's have a look. And he was showing me all the data that was coming from observational work done out of clinics in, in, in Heidelberg in Germany and so on. And, and very good medical doctors that, that were working there. And it was really interesting. So I agreed what we agreed to do um, maybe six years ago from where we are now um, was to build it from the bottom. You know, I was impressed by what, what the information we'd been given, but we really wanted to build it from the bottom and have a command and an understanding. So 
we set up a full PhD program on this, and there was a scientist, Emmanuel, who now um, has, has passed his PhD viva. He's a, now Dr. Emmanuel. He's an OD as well, actually. He's an optometrist hmm. from Ghana who joined us many, many years ago. And he spent two years just studying the literature um, to try and get a comprehension of the mechanisms that nutrition may be involved in. And he taught me, you know, and all these brilliant people taught me. Um, and we learned together in terms of like, you know, something else that your viewers, listeners may, may, may not be familiar with. You're probably trained that the vitreous is a closed system and nothing gets in and nothing gets out. And, mm. you know, that's not the case. You know, there is active and passive transfer of nutrition primarily. And, and remember, we know the composition of the vitreous is primarily water, of course, but you have your proteins, your collagen fibers, your hyaluronins. But nutrition is a big part of that. So really, you know, I couldn't even tell you the, the amount of kind of um, enzymatic, non-enzymatic uh, nutrients, um, antioxidants rather, that, that are present because there's so many of them. But what his work was able to do was really to kind of validate the formulations that, that, that were being put together by um, Ibigavish and Robert Cookling in terms of putting them into um, a formulation. And ones that were naturally occurring, ones that had the properties, and let's talk about them maybe in a minute, you know, your antioxidant, anti-glycation, enzymatic, these are the three proposed mechanisms. So when you look at it, it's, it's, it's classic micronutrients like water-soluble vitamin C. Remember the, the vitreous being water. And, and then we had to really study vitamin C. And there's so much to actually learn about vitamin C. Um, and I wasn't an expert in vitamin C, but, you know, I, I, I correlated it with something that's orange or yellow. And then I said, well, why is the vitreous not orange or yellow? And when you look at it, you, you see it's because vitamin C in the vitreous is not oxidized. It's only orange when it's oxidized. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So there's all these little learnings along the way. But long story short, um, you know, the basic goal here was that is there a formulation that is regulatory approved, safe, allowed to be used? Could you put it together? And that's what a big vision did. And that's what we tested in, in, in part of the, the flies trial. Now, leading up to that, we had this major review published, which is a great read. If, if anyone has a long plane journey coming, you know, it would be a really <laughs> deep dive on literature. Um, that was that, and these are all on my website, these papers, published papers. Um, and we actually partnered um, with Dr. Jerry Sibak on that because there was so much we didn't know and he was the expert. So uh, quite, quite cautiously and nervously, we approached him to see if he'd help us because you know, we were wondering what would he, what would a, a retinal doctor think about nutrition? And I've, I, you know, thankfully he, he came to help us and, you know, very directly gave us some uh, advice and was significantly involved in those publications. And he's going to remain involved, hopefully, as we kind of get ready for kind of phase two of research, which I'll talk about maybe in a minute. But, well, um, yeah, go sorry. Ahead. No, no, I was going to ask you, you know, one of the things that strikes me in all of this is that <clears throat> with all the complexities of of the oxidation and the enzymatic transport and, and the nutrients, you know, uh, my view as a clinician of the, of the vitreous has always been that it's just sort of a remnant from development. And, and it's just sort of a, a mm -hmm. necessary evil that is just left over from the scaffolding that is required to, to supply a mm -hmm. blood flow to the anterior portion of the, of mm -hmm. the eyes. But, well, I guess, uh, the lens of the eye. And yeah. so, and so it's just sort of like left over. I haven't really given it much more thought than that, but, but it strikes me now as you're talking that there's probably some additional benefits, um, that we are not typically thinking of. Are, are there yeah, any well, that, that come to your mind? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. I, I mean, the first one is it provides the optical system for the eye to, the, for the eye to work. It allows for a refract if without a without a vitreous you have no optical system in, to do business in so that's one it provides that system um it, it 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 is your as you know it provides a protective mechanism a shock absorber if you like for for everything that happens when we're run, when we're moving it's that it's protective in that way hmm. um the way i explain it to people that ask me to talk about you know how you know the collagen fibers and where the floaters come from is that I, I, I talk about you know that you made reference to the structural system 
And if you think of the various types of proteins, the various types of collagen that's present, you have your classic ones that are very long and extend throughout the vitreous. And then I, I describe it like a ladder. And then you have these kind of cross links, which are the steps in the ladder. And what we believe is that, you know, the, the cross links can, are oxidized. And when they're oxidized, they slightly change their shape. And then you have these conglomerates and these can mm-hmm. present themselves in the form of these kind of cobwebs or annoying um, disturbances. Um, so, yeah, all of those. Um, it also is likely to be servicing um, other tissues and cells across the retina that we don't know about. The, 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 the very fact that the high nutrient content there, but there's a lot of unknowns around that. So there's a lot more research to do to your question. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the thing that's that, left over. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the the thing that strikes me. The more you talk about that, is that we think clinically as a leftover, but yeah. if it's doing all that other stuff, you know, there's mm. there's no reason that from a from a developmental standpoint that you mm. couldn't have other blood vessels that feed that system that uh, don't have to use a scaffolding to, to do that. I mean, you know, it would probably be a lot easier for retinal vessels to span that distance and have a support structure on the retina. So there's probably some other reason for vitreous. And, and the one that, that is most interesting to me and the one that you made a, a reference to, which again, I don't have any knowledge of per se, but it would make sense that if it holds all these nutrients and requires all this additional input, um, Mm. and has the potential for other, you know, problems with clarity with Mm. time, then there has to be some additional advantage in terms of structural support or enzymatic support or, you know, nutrient support to the rest of the retina or other, you know, posterior segment tissues. So it's just interesting. No, I think so. I think it's very, and Jerry Sibak has these two great expressions, which I think maybe your doctors will use in clinic if they're ever talking about the vitreous in this context. The vitreous is invisible by design. So <laughs> we don't really look at the vitreous until we have to, until we have a problem with it. it. It's invisible. So I like that. And he also says in one of his papers, we need to look at the vitreous and not just through it. Mm-hmm. And I think I think that really sets sets the tone for, for kind of exciting research in this area. I think the other points before we moved into the interventional works were to really to confirm, and we published this as well in another paper. So there's a, there's a bunch of papers on this, but Emmanuel also published work where he quantified the visual function loss as assessed again with uh, photopic contrast sensitivity. Um, and we see that there's a reduction of about 65%, so 65% reduced. So that has a massive effect on vision related <clears throat> quality of life. Um, and Sibak, Sibak did the very same, um, same, same piece. And he's also done kind of um, extraction. He's vitamin C. He's looked at. He's done a lot of work with vitamin C. And you see that in people at risk of vitreous degeneration or with vitreous floaters, that these basic antioxidants are significantly reduced. So that kind of localization of them is different. And the amount. And so understanding why that is 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 is, is something um, for the future. I think. Well, the contrast sensitivity one too is interesting because, you know, it's something that, again, our patients are going to be bothered by, but they don't know exactly how to articulate it. Uh, And we don't generally measure it, uh, most of us. I know Harvey Hanlon has a really good kind of quick uh, and dirty assessment of of contrast sensitivity, but it is not something that by and large we're saying, oh, a patient has floaters. I wonder how their contrast sensitivity is impacted. It's like, I, I tell you that it's not entering in my mind and not just because of, of me, but I talk to doctors all the time. It's just not entering into their mind in terms of contrast yeah. sensit- sensitivity with floaters, but it's an interesting point. And, and it, and it uh, shows you how it can additionally impact quality of quality of life. Yeah. The contrast sensitivity discussion is going around in circles, isn't it? In, 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 in optometry. Um, and, and thankfully, and, and America is doing great here. You know, it's, it's, it's leading the way. Uh, my printer decided to print something. <laughs> um, I'm in terms of caring about, you know, other ways to look at visual function. And um, I, I think that's really important. And I think the issue with contrast sensitivity, Chris, is standardization. The standardization of how we do it because, you know, luminance, yes. all of these things can have a great impact on, you know, the data that you get. And I think... 
I think that's what's missing and we see all the companies now trying to say that they have new ways to assess visual function and it's a race to the finish line maybe you know I know the MNS system in in the US which is which is um, we use their systems for research very very good system um, we use in our research and standardization that is good but you know is how clinic friendly is it then becomes the question I think yes you know, maybe, exactly maybe a VR headset maybe something like this but I don't think the technologies are ready yet um, to, to, to help ODs quickly they'll come and people are working on them but right now today if you ask me what would you get to measure contrast you know you probably all have them in whatever visual systems you're using you just need to probably turn them on and standardize them yourself a little yeah. bit of work but if you, if yeah. you so I mean, much that's the hard time, part yeah. yeah it's the hard part for the individual clinician is to know what to do with that and then how often and how you know you're, you're going to check on it are you going to check for it to improve and then it, it opens up this whole other can of worms of like you know what is visual like what's required for visual function testing and is and then the other can of worms it opens up is like how much how far do you push this in terms of micromanaging the problem i mean i would say that if a patient is symptomatic from it and you can do something to intervene to improve it mm -hmm. and you you do want to have some way to, to measure it and if you can measure that and to know one it reinforces to the patient that you've improved it and two you're you know all the other things that can come from contrast sensitivity so somebody probably does need to um, to pay for that, right? That might, that's not something that you're thinking about, but I think w when we think about like, okay, if I'm going to have a patient back on a supplement and I'm going to see them back, you know, is it medically necessary for me to see them back? Uh, well, I think in the one hand, you would see those patients back at some interval for floaters. You could probably um, combine that, that assessment within that interval, mm -hmm. order it as an additional test that you might do and see if you can improve that. And if it's a, it's an immeasurable improvement, it's one other indicator for the patient to adhere to their treatment. Uh, and also just to understand the, the potential benefits or drawbacks of, of their vision currently. So yeah. uh, anyway, those are just thoughts that I'm having where I think that where would be a resistance to measuring that. I think the main one is standardization uh, and making it simple in the practice. And the other one is like, am I really going to add another test that I'm not going to get paid for? And, you know, like, yeah. well, yes, if it's easy to do and it, it can be combined with some other visits uh, that you're doing. So anyway, uh, those are the thoughts that kind of go through my clinician brain um, well, that's important in terms because of incorporating it. You know, we can do all the science in the world, and if it doesn't get translated to people like you and people that you work with and, and your colleagues, you know, it's it's kind of pointless. So scientists have to listen to your problems and, and find ways to, you know, maybe provide some answer, some solution. I think that the point with, vi with symptomatic vitreous floaters is, is, is an easier one than all our work on macular nutrition because sometimes it's hard to demonstrate the benefits. You know, you look how successful Macu Health has been for yeah. in, in our trials and how the, how the, you know, I was at a, uh, some shows recently and, you know, for me, brilliant validation of the science in, in with Macu Health nutrition is, is the amount of doctors that genuinely came up and said, yeah, this has been great. So we're kind of getting that clinic validation now. Um, in terms of vitreous health and vitreous floaters, it's actually, there's no hiding behind the fact that it's either going to help the, the patients or it's not. And, you know, the comfort I would give your listeners on this is that, yeah, this is one main study. Um, if you look at all the data that's available, we're probably at about 600 reports uh, of people um, that have been on this treatment over a 10 year period. So it's mm. a relatively large sample. The, the, the fly study itself was a, a very select sample of sick, and we might talk about that in a minute in terms of what we actually did and what we yeah, actually Yeah, actually found. that's a gr great place to go because I think okay. I think to, to start, right, when we think about the pyramid, you and I have talked about this, but the pyramid of evidence right now we've mm. got, the fly study is so critical because it aggregates all those other studies underneath it and the learnings from them. But right. then you you, be able, you can kind of now do it in a randomized control trial, placebo yeah. control trial that is masked. Mm. Uh, now your sample size is, is still, uh, the end well, I think is still high enough, right? You're 60, I, I what, was, 61? Yeah, it but, has enough um, power to answer the question for sure. Yeah, exactly. So, so let, let's get right into that then. So, um, so I, I think it's um, we've we've kind of gone through the background, we've gone through the nutrients, and that's yeah. where we get into that ten year period of data. 
Mm-hmm. And then you decide you design the study. So tell me how that study's powered. Tell me the things that you're you're looking at in terms of symptoms and in terms of uh, vitreous floater size, yeah. those sorts yeah. of things. Thank you. So we we needed all the help in the world, and we worked with um, a vitreoretinal surgeon here in in Waterford, Ireland, um, Dr. Eugene Ning. Um, runs a massive uh, vitreoretinal clinic, and his classic treatment for vitreous floaters would have been. Um, um, some vitrectomies, but a laser as well. He he used both, so he would be the atypical surgeon that would try yeah. and treat these. Okay, um, but he was very interested to be involved in something that was kind of uh, micronutrient based, and um, so we spent a we worked with um, a statistician, Dr. Jim Stack, who was a brilliant uh, statistician, and we explained just like we would always do an experiment what we were trying to do, and then we looked at the questionnaires that were available. Um, we looked at Dr. Sibak's work, how he assessed it and others. And um, essentially, to, to kind of summarize it quickly, what we decided to do was power the study based on subjective que- assessments. So how do the patients feel today in terms of how the, the floaters affect their daily quality of life? So kind of scaling it from not bothersome at all to really troublesome to the point that I can't live with these. Um, so there's this kind of scale of assessment. And there was a separate piece to this, which was, can we assess um, the, how it impacts over the previous six months? So we kind of were looking at it from two subjective perspectives there. Um, and so actually, we, when, we, when we were getting full design on the protocol, we were really leading with just subjective, which we know in its own, it doesn't tell you the whole picture. So we wanted to quantify visual functions and everything with that. Um, and what we did was we, we collaborated with local optometry and in addition to the vitroretinal uh, clinic, and we recruited patients who were essentially referred in to that clinic. So they were there because they didn't like having the floaters. They were of all ages. Um, and really, they weren't suitable or had decided not to have any of these treatments that the, the clinic would, would classically do. So we were able to get a recruitment that way. Um, around the same time, and thankfully, w- we were able to work with our OCT system, the Heidelberg Spectralis system, um, and Emmanuel worked with kind of uh, software developers as well to to basically use an approach where we could quantify the floaters because we felt it really important in addition to just like getting self reports and these questionnaire reports to actually quantify them. So now we had something objective to marry with it. And um, so we ran the experiment. It was a six month intervention, placebo control, classic design, as you say. With something like this, you always get a subtle placebo effect. Um, And uh, we we saw a small placebo effect as well. But the difference, you know, the the, the strong effect in the active group was, was, was consistent. Consistent insofar as our subjective reports were really impressive. People got better. Their, their, their wellness got better. Their vision-related quality of life got better. But what was really essential here was that that married up brilliantly well with our quantification of the size of the floaters. So on, on average, I think, you know, we see that about 70% of people on the active group at six months report an improvement, and that marries up with the quantification of the size of their floaters. At the end of the, we didn't get rid of all the floaters, but you're kind of taking them more than half down in terms of how we quantify them, to the point that the it, problem is in, for some people is going away, where the where they report floaters not bothersome at all. Yeah, so I think that's that's a compelling one, right? If, as a clinician, if I want to say something to my patients that continue to complain of floaters, there's there's two things. The first one is. You know, and this has been my impression of it, and it could be completely wrong, but I actually am not suggesting it to my patients or prescribing it to my patients early on in their symptomatic PVDs. So mm. what I don't want to do is say, this is going to take care of that. I don't I don't want to know about any new things. So my, my thought is, if you look at our clinical practice guidelines, depending on the type of PVD and the clinical findings we have, we'd see them on the initial visit and then between two and four weeks and then six months. Well, then at that six-month follow-up, if I've gotten there with my patients and they're still complaining of them, now I'm saying, look, I just don't want to plant the seed like – take this supplement and then you don't have to worry about any new symptoms, right? So I'm trying to remove that away from them. That could be wrong, but I'm trying to remove that away from them. And then I'm also trying to say, we know that over the four, first six months that these things are probably going to 
improve somewhat. So I'm saying, okay, now if you're going to co- continue to complain about these things, now we've got another solution. And then, and then within that, I've got hundreds of patients over the years that are saying, well, Chris, I'm still bothered by these floaters. You know, Dr. Wolf, I'm still bothered by these floaters. And I know it's not a problem because my retina looks okay, but it's still bothering me. They bring it up to me every single time I see them. Well, those are, again, okay, fi- now we've got something for you. And I've got no retina surgeons in Omaha that are going to do a vitrectomy for a patient with floaters. They're just not going to do it. Um, and uh, and most of the, I, I think none of them will use a laser for them either. So anyway, my point is, is that now it, in my hands, that's where I'm using it is, is the longer term solution where patients are still symptomatic as you're suggesting. So then I want to know, um, talk a little bit about the placebo effect. You said there was always a placebo effect. So we get this 70% improvement in symptoms with, uh, with the treatment group, but what was the placebo effect? It, it was, I don't have the exact date off the top, but you see a small, small percentage of, of subjects on the placebo group reporting improvements as well. This was just on the questionnaire-based data, not on the quantification. And that is why you need to have that placebo control design. Right. Because with our statistics, our research question is not, does it get better in this group? Is does it get significantly better in this group compared to this group, the placebo group? And that that's really why you need that placebo control design to address to address that question, I mean, looking at it in basic terms, um, I think you're looking at about less than eleven percent of people on the placebo right. may have reported. So that's the number that I want because essentially what that tells me, and, and this again for for the listeners, the power of this. Okay, so here's the thing: if we can have a seventy percent improvement of, of symptoms in the treatment arm, and he, I'm I'm trying to think what what was compelling to me was that eleven percent about about ten percent it was what yeah. I recall in the placebo arm. That difference between your your uh, treatment arm and your control now you've got a sixty percent improve improvement. Which basically then, if you're going to invert that, your number needed to treat of patients who are going to have symptomatic benefit from this is not that many. It's it's less than two. And so again, in my thought process, one of the things that detracts clinicians from saying, "Well, try this," is the is the concern that this might not be effective for that patient. Yeah. But when the, then when I think about like the quality of life improvement of willing to, you know, that 1.1 years. Um, and I think, okay, well, is if it were, it's not, but if it were a hundred dollars per bottle or a hundred dollars per month, it's not that, that much, right. To the patient. But if it were, you could say $600, right. If it were, if it were $600, would a patient be willing to trade those floaters, a 70% reduction in those floaters, mm-hmm. floater symptoms? Um, would that be worth $600? Yeah, for most people, it probably would. And and most people, when they're bothered by it enough, even if it doesn't have the effect that they think that they, they want, it's still worth the, the, the trial, right? And so that's the kind of power of the of understanding the data and then understanding the benefit and the cost of that benefit becomes really pretty a pretty easy answer to be able to offer it for patients. Yeah, what I'm learning actually is like when I speak to doctors about this, I'm kind of sensitive to the to, to the data and what i mean by that is there, were, there was this 30 percent group that in our experiment were on the active and they didn't get any win but the doctors are saying to me that if they can help some of the patients even if it was a 50 percent like the data suggests it's higher now we're at 70 percent in terms of people getting a win from from doing this i think they're really good odds and i think you know to our earlier point the patient will become their own experiment. If they're really feeling that this is benefiting, they're going to tell you. And we're seeing this already. I I mean, I can show you emails, letters, Mm -hmm. people from across the world who have been on this now, who are genuine. And that's not science. That's just kind of people's observations and people's appreciation. And it's, it's, it's a bit weird when you get those letters. But Unlike anything I've ever seen, that is the, the, the patient satisfaction and the patient appreciation of, of the science, the research, the fact that there's people working to, to really, you know, draw a line between the whole narrative that food supplements are snake oil and that, 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 that. you know, a lot of food supplements are low quality. And that's why what's really important here, and I've always said this, 
to, to you and to, to your colleagues when I, when I lecture on any of these topics is, you know, if, if we go there, that we, that we want to use evidence base and we want to just provide the information and prescribe in some cases to patients that there's opportunities here to reduce your risk of macular degeneration or, or vitreous degeneration or reduce vitreous floaters, that the quality piece is intact. And the quality piece for me is twofold. It's, it's nutrients and interventions that have an evidence base, aka they've been tested in terms of effectiveness, effect, efficacy, but also the quality in terms of the stability. You know, these, when you look at, when you look at the, the micronutrients used in, in vitreous health, there's nothing, there's no big nutrient that we've discovered that we said this is something. It's, it's, these are nutrients that exist naturally in the vitreous. These are nutrients that can be sourced and quantified that we, we know about, uh, you know, zinc or L-lysine or vitamin C. We know about, the, we know about their properties. But, but it's, it's getting them into a formulation that, 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 that provides a potential solution for the patients is something. So I suppose my waffle there is that, look, science is one thing. And evidence is brilliant, and quality is essential. But with 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 this particular effort, the the patients themselves will, will really drive home how successful this is. And what I'm telling you is, what we've seen now from Europe, from Germany, and now in Ireland, across Ireland and, and in Europe, and now thankfully in the US, um, patients that are trying this are really starting to already see the benefit. And I might be wrong. You know, and I'll come back if this if I'll come back on your on your podcast, Chris, if 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 the, if the clinic and if the, the patients tell a different story. But all evidence so far is that people that have a problem with this are getting some reward from enhancing the safe and targeted micronutrients of the vitreous. And it's their well, decision think- to do it. Yeah, and I think I think um, th- the other part of that, which you just briefly touched on, was the objective uh, the objective measures, right? So yeah. we can be, you know, within within the evidence, we're not just looking for the subjective measures; we're looking for the objective measures. And then we have the 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 kind of case studies that you're talking about that support the uh, the research studies, which mm-hmm. is you know how we think about evidence based medicine, where you have you know sort of patient preference, you have uh, clinical research or research studies, and then you have kind of clinical intuition, and they mm. all marry together to to meet that patient uh, where they're at. And um, and so I I do want to discuss a little bit because I you and I have talked about this briefly. Uh, it wasn't until I read the paper that I understood how they were quantifying the size of those floaters, mm. but. One of the things that I was curious about was okay, how are you taking the image? And, and what the way they took the image was to look up, look down, look to the right, look to the left, and capture that uh, that floater in all of those different images. And then uh, based on that location, they could say, okay, well, this isn't just the like a posterior vitreous detachment that is that is pushing anteriorly, thus creating a shadow on the retina that is inherently uh, less dense, but maybe larger in size. Uh, it was mm-hmm. actually qu- able to quantify the actual size. So this idea, the, the question I had for you originally was, well, John, is this just that time goes on and, and it, uh, you know, if the patient has a posterior vitreous attachment, we're just naturally going to get less impact from the floaters. And you said, no, uh, the the way this study was designed is we were able to actually measure the floater size, which I thought mm-hmm. until I read it, I wasn't entirely sure how they did that. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. that's how they did it. And I think that's really important. That's right. And, you know, obviously the floaters can move. And if it's if it's close, so the that's all kind of calculated in terms of the resolution, how they go to and get to that image. It's all controlled back. And, and you know, for comfort, I can tell you that the the repeatability of the assessment, we, we do what's called ICC interclass correlations. Um, it's 0.999. It's almost 100 percent agreement. If I do you now, I'll do you tomorrow. I'll do you, I'm going to get the same score on that on that uh, fl- floater um, that we bring that we bring into picture. Um, so that was really um, statistically and we were we were really careful there. Um, it was, probably did most work on on the imaging in this entire experiment. Um, because yeah. it, was, it was pretty novel ground, you know, and Heidelberg are obviously delighted that we were able to use their system to do it as well. And 
I think know. it would be really interesting for Hyderabad to use that that technology that they've. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, it would it would change our approach uh, as clinicians to managing patients with with vitreous floaters if they could actually figure out an algorithm within that that it would be easy easily capturable and measurable over time uh where you could actually image that entire vitreous and then quantify that improvement just like we can yeah. with macular degeneration and drusen and yeah. i mean um i'm sure they're probably wizards are thinking <laughs> about that already but i that would be super cool like if you're thinking yeah. about what would be helpful for clinicians well it would be really helpful when our signs and symptoms align and, and mm. a patient comes back in and says, you know, why, you know, I, I am that 30% group and it's not helping me at all. And we could say, yeah, it's interesting. I can measure this and it, it is shrinking. You know, we can, we can measure it. Here's before, here's after it's shrinking, but why is this patient's symptoms? And that leads me to another point. Were there any learnings? Cause there's a whole bunch of other things that you guys looked for, um, in, in all of those patients, were there any learnings from the 30% that didn't respond? What was there yeah, something no. about those patients? A great question. We, we, we couldn't see anything that was unique. So, you know, the, the first place we went to was like the, the stage of vitreous degeneration, like, cause you made, you've made reference to PVD a couple of times on this call, rightly. So the, the effect was greatest for more advanced, but it wasn't significantly different. People with very early stage, um, degeneration. So they didn't have PVD. So they're at that very early stage. So they, they, they benefited as well and so there was no maybe we didn't have enough power really in the sample to do that but we didn't see anything to answer your question we didn't see anything age or nutrition or gender or even visual functions you so know, you did look at nutrition too I, I guess i i must have um see how, how i guess it may not what have gone of, into the paper um well it may not I, yeah i yeah. did but i but i may it just may have skipped me when you um I, I I just don't recall oh. like how did you assess their nutrition? That's just another Sorry, thing I, that, to think I'm about. I'm saying we may not have put we're, oh, we're to blame oh, here, not oh, you. We okay. may not have put it in the paper. Okay. Um, yeah, we well we did we did basic dietary assessment um, and we you know lifestyle assessment. We also measured carotenoids because that's what I do with, yep. for a living. Um, and um, we didn't see anything that. W that told us why the 30 percent where the 30 percent and i think that's probably something that we need to go and the other question is like does that 30 percent get less if we intervene for longer for I've longer done this presentation yeah. a few times now and i'm asked all these really you know great questions like what happens if we stop and i'm like i don't know <laughs> what happens mm -hmm. if we go for longer what happens if we double dose there's this is brilliant research and it's time to be used but i do think you know, um, there's there's a good bit more to do. We're at the moment we're planning a couple of new uh, pieces of research related to the vitreous and um, building upon this. One of them is, um, and I'm in conversation with Dr. Jerry Silback around. He's very interested to actually quantify vitreous micronutrition following intervention with vitreous health. So he wants, as a doctor, he wants to he wants us to look at the vitreous itself and detect the magnitude of change. So. That's probably one experiment. The other experiment is the dose response. Um, you know, it, what happens if we do, were to do more or slightly less? What happens if we go for longer? But it's easy to say we're going to do that. I mean, flies took, you know, five years from at the university from when we started looking at the protocol mm. to getting the scientists to do it to doing. People don't realize that. It's why it's why I get infuriated when when it, it gets dismissed in medicine that it's a small study because we're not big pharma, you know, we're, we're academics at a university and we, we fight for our life to get grants and we work with organizations, you know, non-exclusively across the world, MacuHealth. Uh, actually, MacuHealth, we've spoken about this before, they've never even supported financially any of the research we've done. We. I think that's super important for, I, I know I yeah. brought it up at the beginning, but obviously mm -hmm. Macu Health has, has allowed me to have access. Not that, I mean, I had access mm -hmm. to you before Macu Health was a sponsor, but, um, but it, it becomes a little bit, uh, the connections with, with you and Jim and all those other sorts of things mm -hmm. is what I really love about that, mm -hmm. about that partnership is I can say, I can say, Hey, uh, Frederick, can I, can you put me in touch with this guy and that guy? And, and he's mm -hmm. like, yeah, let's do it. And mm -hmm. so that's what what's really one of the main values for for the podcast. I think is it it puts me in touch with with people uh, like yourself. Um, yeah. But I, I think that you can't overstate that point enough. Is is mm -hmm. this? There's a thought that John Nolan is MacuHealth, 
And yeah. I want you to clarify that one more time. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, I'm employed by the university here, Southeast Technological University in Waterford. So, um, you know, I, I hold a chair here that's funded by the Herod Foundation UK. They're a charity in the UK. But our, our research primarily has been supported by competitive grants. So our, myself and my colleagues, we write research grants. So I'd say about 90% of our funds have come from competitive research grants to do what we do. The easiest way to explain it is I look at MACU Health or Vitreous Health, the formulations, as part of the methodology. So what do I mean by that? If I'm measuring vision, I want to have the best technique to measure contrast or the best HPLC in the chemistry lab to measure carotenoids in the blood. Part of our research is having a formula that's stable and effective. Why wouldn't I use MACUL's intervention? Because we've, we've looked at them all. We've looked at their stabilities. We've looked at the optimal amounts. So I pick it because it's, it's something that has an existence that, that, that we're able to use. So, uh, but to your question, I mean, you know, Jim Stringham and I, Jim was an academic. He's now employed directly by MacuHealth. Um, so I, I, would have, I would have an academic relationship with Jim. We would co-author on works. We work together as postdocs in Max Notterly's lab in Augusta, Georgia. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can use any formulation I want in, in, in the experiments we do, and we've used them all. I've used Bosch and Lom products. I've used um, many different products from across the world. And um, the, the future is, you know, we, work, we, we apply for funding to what's called Horizon Europe. It's European grant agencies. Um, it, the relation, one relationship that's clearly pre present between MACU Health and as you can say, John Nolan, is that I'm chair of the Bonn Conference, which is a mm -hmm. conference that's, that's um, run in Cambridge. And we have a big announcement coming about that soon. We hope to move it to, to the U.S. And MacuHealth would be a sponsor of that conference, so an unrestricted uh, sponsorship for that conference. But that, that's a non-for-profit conference. All the money goes into supporting the professors and the scientists to travel from across the world to go there. Um, it's a it's a bona fide academic conference. So, but they they do greatly, and we appreciate their support and that of others as well. You know, um, uh, BASF. Um, uh, I don't want to forget anyone now. Bega Vision, Industrial Organica, um, and we're open to work with any organisation that want to, you know, get part of the scientific uh, works that we do and support people. Abbott, have, Abbott are always part of it. So there is this connection between industry and academia. There has to be in this new world. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's how it works. We need to see, but we have to work through university policies, technology. Like, I don't own any intellectual property on the work I've done. Full clarity, I don't own anything. I'm an inventor on many of these, but the... the being an inventor and intellectual property are very different things. People don't understand that. Um, as, a, as a scientist that works here, I assign all my discoveries to the university mm. and they may partner with, uh, so it's ma with uh, industry and it's safely managed that way. So yeah. that, that's important. Yeah, I, so, no, I think I, I wanted to hit that point just because you, you brought it up again and, and, uh, and I wanted to make that disclosure because I think it's important. But but you brought up, and I think this might kind of round out our conversation because you brought up the the last um, idea of well, what's next? What do I do uh, once we, you know, one, once that six month time period goes? And I, I think your answer is exactly right. We don't know. We don't know for sure. But um, and I don't know. I, I but as I think about this more, the, on the one hand, I would say, well, if it's if it's improved that patient's symptoms, uh, maybe we stop it. And see if mm -hmm. symptoms return. You know, does it improve mm -hmm. the patient symptoms? You stop and things get worse again, mm -hmm. or is it intuitive enough? And this is where I'm thinking more about it: is if the vitreous is a is a structure that's supporting other things, and yeah. you know, we talked about PVDs, but we also talked about floaters. And if the floaters are just a uh, a clumping together and and misalignment of those normally clear collagen fibrils that have now mm -hmm. uh, become opacified because of their structural changes, then do we use it for longer? 
Well, we can't answer that with a study, right? But it might be intuitive. To, we can't answer it now with a study, but it might be intuitive to, to think that maybe it would. Maybe it would be beneficial to support it longer. Maybe that 30% of patients did need a different dose mm-hmm. or they did need to carry out the, the treatment for longer. Um, and so that's where I, what I think the beauty of being a clinician is, is that, is that you know, evidence-based medicine is, um, has so long been thought, and, and I've misthought it as well, that it is just pure research. It's the pyramid of evidence, right? But um, but remember that does that is important, super important. But it's also important to to be able to apply that evidence to a specific patient population that may have been excluded from the evidence or included, and then also being able to say, well, what's the logic behind that evidence? How does that logic actually make sense? And does it does it mean that the the study just wasn't long enough to answer the question, but it doesn't mean that it, it stops, right? It stops after six months. So, well, it's no big deal. We just stop then, you know, well, no, maybe we do keep going. Um, or maybe we stop and see if that patient's symptoms come back. And if they come back, you start again. I mean, it's just an interesting thing to really think through. Um, and it's kind of the unknown, right? You guys get to provide us with really good, uh, information about what we do know and what we can know. And then we get to take the, what we can know and think, how would we apply this in a clinical situation? Thoughts? That's the beauty. This is the beauty of it because let's just say I do a dose response or a twelve month intervention, and we do phases. Like you, you answer all those questions, and you create a whole other bunch of questions, <laughs> which, yeah, which right. is fine. Which is fine. I, I think the point I'm trying to make is sometimes you have to kind of work with the evidence that you have. Um, exactly. You know, exactly. You have to work with what we have. We can always look for the next piece. You know, the, the interesting thing about these nutrients, I think it's relatively quick by which they get into the vitreous. And we need to determine that. Um, but th- there's some evidence is, like these are water soluble. The fat soluble carotenoids that we use take time to affect the target tissues. I'm, I'm of the view that we can get these nutrients into the vitreous relatively quickly. And while we didn't cut the experiment before six months, so I, don't, I can't honestly tell you what would happen or what we know because that was the design and you're not allowed to play with the design once you once you publish what you're going to do but what we're seeing kind of clinically come back is you know relatively quickly you know four weeks five weeks six people are starting to notice um Mm. difference and i'm one of those you know uh, here here's the supplement here now it's 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 the one i've never missed this since january of this year and 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 the reason being is i mentioned my tennis playing earlier i was in Hawaii. I'm not sure if I told you this story, but I was in Hawaii at the Island Eyes conference I was presenting um, with Fraser Horn and the group uh, out of the Pacific. And um, I was doing my macular pigment work and I had this really bad experience, unfortunately, where I was out for my run and I went swimming and I got into trouble in the ocean. And I was basically saved by a teenager with a surfboard. Oh God. Yeah, so I'm lucky to be here. I was, I was, I was pretty much gone. So, yeah, remarkable experience. At seven thirty in the morning, this kid saved my life, and I had to get on with my day. But the point is, I felt following that that my floaters, which I had, became much more of a problem. Hmm. So I remember getting back to Ireland, and I was playing tennis um, one morning, and I came back and I said to Jane, "That was awful." Jane might be my wife. That was awful. I said, "I'm going to have to take my own medicine here." So I um, started taking uh, Vitreous Health Vitrocap that day and um, I genuinely would not go without it now. That's my hmm. experience. Wow. You know, so wow. Let's well, see. I, I'm going to have, I, it's probably on a long run, I'm going to have to explore that story about, uh, about the yeah. surfer kid, but I'll leave that for another, another day. Another day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. John Nolan, thanks so much for doing this again. Always. It's always yeah. so enlightening.